Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be, whatever your time zone of choice is. My name is Donald Hutera, and I would like to welcome you to Taiwan Season 2020 Online Symposium, Connecting with Taiwan. This is the fourth of the 16 sessions that we're providing online throughout August in the absence of actually being in Edinburgh live, presenting performances and conducting this symposium live. The way the symposium works is we have three sessions per week. Um, the first is on Tuesdays. I have an informal 45 minute conversation with one of the four choreographers whose work would have been presented at either Dance Base or Summer Hall in Edinburgh this month. There are film clips involved in that. And uh, also uh, you're invited to ask questions uh, during those sessions, which are repeated on the following Thursday. And then on Wednesdays and Fridays, there is a two part, two hours in each part webinar with various Taiwanese and international experts in artistic practice, production, programming, and presentation. Uh, there are also question and answer possibilities. You can use at any point the comment box, the chat box on the side of your screen or wherever you happen to be watching this. And also at the end, if you are brave enough or have a desire to engage with us, you're invited to come on stage to the virtual stage and join us in the StreamYard room to uh, speak directly, more directly to the um, uh, panel. Also, um, we are having through the fringe on Monday, August 10th at 11 a.m. Uh, British time, um, a showcase and pitch from 11 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. in which each of the four choreographers will explain a bit about who they are and their company, show longer clips than are seen in the Tuesday artist interview sessions. And then you are also able to go into breakout rooms with two of the four choreographers, the two, the two you most want to um, know more about. So moving right along, um, today we are in the second part of, and I need to look at my notes because it's quite a mouthful, present and future of Taiwan arts and culture centers. And today's session is multi-community arts education and development. Now the keynote speaker is Hui Mei Li, who is now an independent curator and producer but she was for many years um, embedded in a very creative way in the National Theater and Concert Hall in Taipei, where she was also the artistic director. She has been involved in venue management, in programming, in education, financial management, marketing, festival curating. She's been a, a major force in promoting Taiwanese contemporary dance and theater and making international links. Hui Mei, please join me on screen. Hello, Donald and everyone on the stream. Uh, welcome back to this section. And what, what have you got planned today, Hui Mei? Uh, I'm going to share uh, the, the multi-community arts education and development. So I will, should I start? I, okay. I just like to, we're, you are having three guest speakers as well, uh, two from Taiwan and one from Scotland, and we will bring them on, on, on screen later. But yes. take it away, Hui Mei. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have give you, given you a brief introduction to the Public Arts and Culture Center in Taiwan last time. Now I like go further. Besides the three, sorry. Okay. 
Besides the three national values in Taipei, Taichung, and Kaohsiung, there are more than 40 arts and cultural centers uh, located in different areas, most of them in the west of Taiwan, in accordance with its population. In 2017, the Ministry of Culture, in order to come cultivate arts appreciation of the population and arts professionals to assist the local governments to shape the characteristics of arts and culture. A special subsidy has been opened to the local centers to apply. Thus, following the policy, the local arts centers are encouraged to plan and develop more educational projects and festivals by their own. Taipei is exceptional within these local cities. No need of subsidy. Taipei Arts Festival, founded since 1998, has been co-sponsored by the Taipei City Government Cultural Bureau and Taipei City Cultural Foundation, and is the platform to encourage young people to create and provide cultural resources to showcase Moreover, Children Arts Festival and Taipei Fringe were held by city government. Until three years ago, TPAC, Taipei Performing Arts Center, took over festival programming and started Adam Project. That's in for short, Asia Discover Asia, meeting for contemporary performance with international workshop and connections. Next, let's go to other cities such as Tainan, Jiayi, Yunlin, and Zhanghua. These local public arts centers keep on strengthening their educational projects. Outreach becomes a phenomenon and focus recently due to the new policy. Besides the subsidy, I think the national value bring up a new competition but also stimulate the local arts market. Curiosity of the new and the fancy venues nearby attracts people's attention and drives them to pay a visit. The first encounter is important if you can grasp the chance to convert the visitors into audience. Therefore, every new center works very hard for that. In addition, education projects and outreach are developed and provided to the public. Of course, that bring in new audience too. Like Tainan, Young uh, Youth Arts Festival, Zhanghua Theater Festival, and Taoyuan Arts Festival combined with educational projects successfully now are popular and recognized in Taiwan. There are many different resident projects in National Performing Arts Center, I mean the national venues and local centers. Most of them are open to the local artists, except Taipei Arts Village. The annual open call of arts in residence, Taipei, welcome the vision, uh, visual and the performing artists to apply. Many public and private museums in Taiwan offer residency to, uh, residency to local as well as international artists, but not performing artists. Maybe the language and the budget are the problem need to be solved for the art centers, but I'm expecting there is more international residency in Taiwan in the near future, not only to stimulate local artists' creation, but also intrigue audience to open their mind with various points of view. Regarding to educational development of arts, interestingly, not only the regional art center of Zhanghua, Jiayi, Xinzhu and Taidong, but also national venues, especially 
future on youth education projects during these years. In 2015, as the artistic director of NTCH, I set a team. Okay. In 2015, as the artistic director, I set a team to develop the education project called as NTCH to go. Let me check my presentation PPT first. I think, oh, here, sorry. That's uh, the picture of National Theater and Council Hall. It's the project I called um, NTCH to go. So that's, that's in, happened in, started from 2015. I have a team to do a lot of educational projects for elder, youth, children, and disability. And we started our arts outreach, not only in the outdoor of NTCH, but also in villages and countryside of Taiwan. In 2017, we created a miniature auditorium in MRT carriages to celebrate our 30th anniversary and invite passengers getting close to us. Besides NTCH, of course, the national venues, NTT and Weiwuying also focus on building their own educational platform. In Kaohsiung, the south part of Taiwan, Weiwuying provides music contemporary dance and new circus workshops, and NTT Plus formulate her academy from musical drama to dance, impress local people a lot. And in terms of the policy of Ministry of Culture, the regional venues are motivated to face the problem of population decline and as markets stay still. So, how to develop education and promotion dedicated to different groups to experience the performing arts in various ways and to participate in theater activity become aware. Yunlin is Taiwan's agricultural city. Traditional hand puppets is her significant cultural assets. The preservation and development is urgent. So various, uh, various educational projects have been started by the local art centers. Tainan, the other example, the city full of Taiwanese cultural characteristics in the theater, age of 16 celebration has been transformed to the 16 Arts Festival that encourages young people to grow experience and story to create. With art cultivation combined with life education, bring youth a very, very special and unforgettable adult gift. Zhanghua Art Center also invite the resident artists to work on drama workshops and script reading for youth. Later, Ben Ting Huang, the manager of arts education from NTT, and Shi Jie Zhang, the director of Jia Yi Performing Arts Center, and Morak Dai Days, the artist director of Dance Base Edinburgh, they will join us. NTT is located in the center part, not far from Taipei. Due to its geography, it's not only must break through the burden of the of her elder sister NTCH, but must also create a new battlefield with its outstanding outreach programs and international connections as well. NTT will be a window for us 
to know more about the national venues, how to experience on regional cooperation and challenges of different educational programs. Jiayi Performing Arts Center, which closely cooperates with Wei Wuying, is the only big arts and cultural park in Taiwan with performance, education, exhibition, leisure, and other functions. I'm wondering how Shi Jie managed this heavy task with his energetic efforts. The attempt of local venues to link international is reflecting cultural vitality in Taiwan. How this unique venues to create a future in Taiwan's theaters layout will be a topic of anticipation. In addition, it's our pleasure to have a Morag to share how things develop in Scotland for everyone. I believe there will be a, an interesting dialogue and a good start of international networking after this webinar. And thank you all. Back to Donna. Wait, May. Yes. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for that uh, presentation. I really liked your graphics, by the way. I enjoyed looking at that. It was good. It stimulated my brain. And my brain is stimulated in five areas, I think. Um, here's what the, the, some of the things I was thinking about as I was listening and watching. Um, you mentioned converting visitors into mm -hmm. participants. So I'm thinking about that process. That's one, and, and this, these perhaps five things that I'm thinking of can be talked about later throughout this entire session. I'm also thinking about artists and how interested they may be, or if they need to have a fire lit under them to um, be involved in social creative engagement. Because I, I know artists here in the UK who are not so interested in doing outreach work, but they feel sometimes that they are compelled by the funding system to do that, that they must provide that. Uh, so that's a slightly controversial area. I'm also interested in international residencies in Taiwan, how complicated that is to um, activate what the process might be if there's anybody from other countries who would want to uh, engage culturally with Taiwan. I'm also thinking about uh, modern technology and in this virtual world that we are now living in especially, um, how much uh, activity around um, today's technology is part of arts education and engagement. Um, I'm almost done. Um, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but again, things are firing in my brain. I'm thinking too about COVID and the chaos of COVID um, and it, the economics of the arts in 2020. And lastly, education of um, artists and teachers in Taiwan. I, I would be interested to hear uh, how that is developing. So. I know I've thrown a lot in your direction. Please feel free to address any of, of those issues that take your fancy, Kwe Mei. Okay, uh, let's go to the first question. Okay, uh, you are asking the artists, they are not willing to do the outreach or the educational projects. The same situation in Taiwan. They don't want to do that. They like to make their own creation. But just the same question, because the policy of the government or the policy of the theater, they are forced to do that. Of course, we are learned together because in the past, I actually, I don't have idea about how to engage with the community need. We always concern people buy your tickets, become my audience. That's only I concerned in my first 10 years. But the later I find it's not easy to always ask people to buy 
tickets via your promotion strategies and maybe very good commercial uh, application. Then after the second stage, I think we, I start to think about that. We need more educational work to, to, to invite the artists to participate. But in that stage, it's difficult because a lot of artists, they're still willing to have their own creation because they're short of a budget, also time and energy. So in the third 10 years, the last decades I work at the theater, I think people change their mind, especially artists. They know they have to create their work. In the same time, they need to know more about people, to let the audience to know them. So that's why I start to have a team to work with the people and work with the artists. We open our mind to work together and to learn together and to find what can we do for them. And I start the engagement with the communities. So that's the first question about the technology arts or oh, a lot of topics okay in the government policy a lot of uh, projects need uh, people to get involved but actually i think the resource is not enough especially you you're talking about teaching that's the question actually i want to ask morat because we don't have a very good institution or school to teach our artists to work with the other or disability. So we have a lot of problems during the workshops, also uh, for the classes open to the special people, actually. So inclusive arts is just beginning in Taiwan. So we need to have a more dialogue and conversation in this topic later. Thank so. you. <laughs> Thank you for fielding all those questions. And I would encourage uh, anybody there in our audience who might have questions or might have direct experience to you know, consider asking those questions or later coming on board to join us to talk about their experience. Yes. Anything else before we introduce your first guest? Uh, I think um, maybe I can spare some time for them because I, I think people will ask them more than I, I can answer. <laughs> okay. I'm just checking if we've had any questions so far. Not yet, but we welcome. We welcome your input. Listen, this audience that is watching us, they are participants as well. This yes. is an educational experience, Kwe Mei. Yes. That we are doing right for now. me, it's my first time to on the website to talk. <laughs> well, you're doing beautifully. I'm enjoying Thank your you. company. Thank you. So, um, shall we um, invite Penting? guest number one? Yes. Yes. Penting, are you there? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So, Penting uh, Wang. You are manager of arts education at the National Taichung Theater, the right. NTT. Yes. But you are you have also in the past been a colleague of Kui Mei's yes. at the National yes. Theater in Hartford. Right. And I also I know you you um, you are interested in audience participation and you've also got a particular interest perhaps in emerging artists. Yes, indeed. Um, let's hear from you um, about what, what you are going to share with us today. Right, I just uh, quickly introduce our theater, then I will come back to the audience development and how the education in Thai, National Taizong Theater, what we did in a Pass. Actually, the department is only one year. We just uh, established in 2019. So let's quickly to see my PPT first. Okay. okay. Can we share? Okay. 
Does everyone yeah, can, can see my? Okay. We may be having some technical uh, problem. <laughs> Uh, can we share soon? Okay. Can we? Sh okay. 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 We're getting ready to roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> the anticipation is building. Okay. There it is. Yeah, we did. Okay, this is the um, National Taichung Theater. But um, I just quickly introduce the location of National Taichung Theater. So you can see the slideshow on the screen. So we are um, in the central of Taiwan. We located in the central of Taiwan. And we just started to operate in 2016. So to the north, uh, there is a National Theater and Council Hall which is the uh, right-hand side up to the right-hand side. And to the south, there is the National Kaohsiung Center for the Arts, which we call Wei Wu Ying. Three of us are the independent administrative corporations and under the National Performing Arts Center. But we three of us are subsidized by the Ministry of Culture. Um, you can see um, the photo here. The entity is surrounded by the high-end residential area. So we are in the central. So apart from entity uh, in Taichung, there are at least other seven venues under uh, city uh, cultural affair Bruno uh, monitored by the Taichung city government. So actually in Taichung, we, we have like eight venues in the big Taichung city. So um, NTT is, um, we have three uh, major menu, uh, venues. Uh, you can see the red color is Grand Theater and the blue color is the middle size we call Playhouse Theater. And green color is the black box. Okay, the Grand Theater is, um, all, the capacity is like 2,000 seats. So it's like this, it's like opera house. And the playhouse is quite a uh, good size for the 800 seats. So it's like this. And we have, the third one is black box. So it's like a uh, normal uh, black theaters. We have 200 seats capacity. Um, because we don't have a concert hall, so you can tell our venue have um, have to do the complex function. Um, we have to manage uh, different forms such as Western Chinese opera, ballet, orchestra, chamber, or even solo concert we have to do in the Grand Theater. Of course, we do contemporary dance and drama. So we, uh, in these three venues, we present our own programs. And we also release parts of the schedules for local company or artists, as well as the local agency to rent and to present their shows. So you, could, you probably can tell that our venue schedules are quite busy. Then we also, uh, from these photos, you can see that we also have other outdoor or indoor space to organize not only programs, but also activities, uh, special events, workshops, lectures, film, and so on. So you can see. Uh, so from these photos, that basically people could visit NTT freely. So we open um, from Tuesday to Sunday. So once we open uh, at 11.30, the people can just um, freely to join to the lobby to visit, even to um, the second floor, to the sixth floor, to the sky garden. But, so it's quite open buildings and architectures. So we are trying to achieve the goal, which is 
trying to build up a theater for arts and life. Therefore, uh, NTT utilized different methods to contact people and close to the public. If you enter the buildings, you could explore different things related to arts, either performing arts work, uh, or we also have the irregular different exhibitions, installations, film, and so on. So we hope the NTT becomes a part of your life, a place you want to visit even when there are no performances. So you can just have uh, quickly look the photos. So left hand, um, right hand side is we have uh, a film that on, on the first, on the sixth floor, the Sky Garden. Then we also have the exhibitions, our exhibition room. And uh, we have, we also have the, uh, another exhibition space uh, in the lobby. So we do some um, spatial, ex we arrange the spatial ex uh, exhibitions. And we also have the uh, another outdoor theaters uh, which, which we can do the performances or do some other spatial activities. Um, basically, um, Basically, the main products for the NTT are still programs, of course. So no doubt there is a program department uh, organized the international and regional inviting um, programs. On the other hand, we also commission national and inter international productions. And since NTT opened, compared to the past, indeed, we have more and more people are willing to purchase tickets to participate and appreciate to see performances. The number of the audience, especially the local, are growing up. Um, each performance we just, uh, we think is like 50% uh, or up from the big Taizong area. And the average age is about 30 to 40 years old. So however, we found the age uh, around 40 to, six, 40 to 60 are highly participations that related uh, to Taizong economic uh, society environment. When they were young, uh, because we think when they were young, they had to pay attention to their family and work. So they don't have uh, much, uh, many op op um, opportunities and places to experience arts. So when NTT is a uh, uh, opened. Uh, it is a place that changed their lifestyle and becomes a social occasion for Taizong people. So they can just come to see the performance and just do their social activities as well. So it's a quite different observations compared to other cities, which I guess I, I observed. So even though the number of um, audience is growing up, however, uh, they are still not enough and stable for us. We still need to um, devote more time and pay attention to audience developments to attract them to join us. Um, but it's not simple. Um, I think it's not a simple just use the top down methods just to uh, just keep like promoting performers all the time and ask them to just buy the tickets. So uh, I think we just have, we, um, I think they are quite new group. So they are not uh, for millions what the theater performance is. Therefore, at the same time, we established um, arts education department in 2019. Um, this is because that we intended to use different subjects to approach them gradually and to look for and calculate motivated um, potential people who might become our audience in the near future. So in arts uh, education department, our targets are divided into four parts, basically. Um, we have young and elder, then we have teacher and students, we have general public, and we also have the theater profession, professionals. So our goals would like to achieve like, uh, to have them to have uh, creative learning and thinking, like incubation and diffusion and professional um, training and exchange. 
So this is the uh, back city or arts education wants to develop in the um, meanwhile. And also in the past more than three uh, years, our work, uh, we work very hard to contact school teachers to encourage students to see performance as well. However, it's only a certain of classes which is interested in participating. Um, I think because the students, uh, they don't have much time to attend um, performance, they have to work, they have, uh, they have to study very hard. So even like Sunday or Monday, they have still do the extra um, additional studies in school or in other um, private school. So uh, they don't have like uh, motivations to join like the performing arts activities. So um, most of the young people in Taichung, uh, they know where the entity is, but they don't even come to visit. Even they don't check the uh, website as well. So not to mention to the performers, you can, you can understand. Uh, therefore, part of my job or my, my team is trying to different ways to con connect the young people, which is our another uh, major work in the near future. And we want to have um, more conversations uh, via activities, workshop, or different kinds of forms, which they might be more interested in, not only just um, give them performance all the time. Uh, I do believe that um, these young people, they, they just don't know how to get in touch with us. Uh, they don't have another, they don't have the platform or they don't have the channels to, to know what is the performing arts is. So they need someone like the opinion leaders to recommend or encourage them to, to join or to participate. So this is uh, part of my job, um, uh, my staff, that we uh, do some research or do, uh, do some jobs to, to um, get involved in to the young people. Um, I think once they join our activities, they are quite enjoy and open their mind to think and to share. So uh, we've just created uh, many, many opportunities to um, to attract people to deliver creative ideas and imagine that they could help us to diffuse. So um, I just stopped here and probably we can have more discussion later. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was fascinating. And uh, I felt like I've been on a, <laughs> on a small tour of the MT. Uh, do you have, a, well, I, I was wondering, um, Penting, what is the size of your team? How many people are working directly with you in arts education um, at the, the MTT? For the arts department, arts education department, we have 15, one five. Okay. Yeah, That's, yeah. That seems because, very healthy uh, in, to me. Before the 2019, uh, we only have like, a, uh, we have the um, division of the arts education. Just, uh, um, arts promotion, so it's under the um, program planning department. So it's just a small size. So once we want to do uh, more focus on to uh, do some community activities, so we just uh, establish a new department. That's why we just grow up to the 15 people. I also wonder about um, what kind of targets do you set for yourselves in terms of, I don't know, reaching how many hundreds or, or you know, how do you break down, uh, you mentioned young people, but how do you break down audience targets? For the young people, we uh, focus, excuse me, we focus on like 12 to 18. Like, in, yeah. 12 to 18 years old. 10 to, 10 to 18. And, and what about numbers? Do you have do you have goals about how many young people you want to engage? You know, two hundred or is that too flexible? Um, uh, it depends on the, what kind of activities we achieve. So normally we have the special events or 
uh, activities happens in our um, uh, the playhouse theaters. So every year we arrange like uh, maybe two to four activities. So every time we can have 600 students and teachers to come in. So it's, de it's um, it depends on what kind of the uh, activities. And also because the schedules uh, mainly is for the um, performances. So we just have less schedules that we can organize the um, spatial arts activities for spatial group. And uh, there's been a question about how do you break down those audience targets? I, I think that might be, um, do you have other groups that you are targeting? Are you, are you needing to go after older people or are they coming in by themselves already? Yeah, as I mentioned, let's, uh, it's quite an uh, interesting up, um, up, uh, observation that we have kind of uh, 40 to 60 uh, years old people to come to uh, our theater. Part of the reason, I think, because they are quite uh, financial independent. And, and also, they don't, uh, in the past, when they were young, they don't have many opportunities to participate in uh, arts activities. Those why, um, and the very, uh, the married earlier in Taichung. So I think 40, 50 uh, years old, their, their children are already grown up. So they have to do some their own uh, activities, which they like. So another group that we are focused it is the elder people. Uh, so we arrange the workshop and some lecture and uh, lecture performance to um, attract them to, if they are wants to know the performing arts um, information or they want to do some other uh, information related to, to the arts, not only performance arts, then we welcome them to join uh, via lectures or lecture performance. Even we have like the elder workshop workshop for elder, like we have three classes. One is like a traditional opera. Then the second one is like a physical uh, training. Then the third one is a musical because they love to sing without any pressures. Then the third, the third group, the major group will be the um, professionals. Yeah, so we have... Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. And we have like residence programs as well. So Which this year. Professional uh, development, yes? Yeah. And we have like residence uh, artists. Uh, every two years, we have uh, different artists to join. Then this year, uh, just in July, we uh, we launched uh, the new, uh, uh, very young artists like. Uh, under the 25 years because normally we think that we give a lot of opportunities for uh, emerging artists or like uh, outstanding artists uh, already to do their own productions but now we more uh, take care of the, we are thinking that we have to take care of, like uh, the years of the, under the 25 years they just graduated from the university but they don't know how to get into the market or they don't know how to connect with the prof uh, professional uh, venues or the artists to get uh, improved. So that's why uh, just uh, this July we, we launched uh, these programs and we now have the six, six uh, artists, uh, uni university students to join us. Then we have like two, uh, two teachers to take care of them. Yeah. Okay. Now, there have been a couple of que questions that have come in um, about how do you aim to educate people for the Performing Arts Center? Um, do you aim that they could become volunteers, perhaps? And also, and I was going to ask this as well, do they pay for the activities they join? Um, are there free activities? What is the cost that the different activities uh, will incur? Okay, uh, generally the activities is free, but the workshop and the lecture for performance is, is happen in the theaters. We just charge 
for just um, a little money. Okay. Right. Okay. And we we all we, we did we have the volunteer like one hundred persons in the in, in theater because you can uh, just I mentioned that it's a quite open space. So we need a lot of um uh, just volunteer to help us to introduce the space when vi uh, the visitor can sign if they want to tour. So that's why we got a lot of the retired um, people from school or for the companies. They, they are quite interesting to help people to introduce on um, our theater. And this certain group is also our, um, our ba audience basis. So they quite enjoy to to um, to participate our performance and any activities, and they would like I, to share. I was going to say that they sound like your bedrock, like your <laughs> your your people foundation. Uh, sure. Another question is: Have you ever run consultant sessions with local residents to ask them what they want to see and take part in? at the theater? Uh, we, not really, no. Is that something that you think might be valuable to do? Yeah, I think so, yes. But because we, uh, we only have run two, because we, our resident, uh, residence programs are two years Per, per, per time. So we just finished the, the second round. So we still have a lot of uh, things to change or to, to develop. So each, each, um, each time we have different, um, different rules. So we, we also just uh, um, do some research which part will be really good for the artists to, to get a uh, connection with the theater. Because I imagine not only are audiences and artists developing all the time, but the venue itself is developing. Yeah, 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 yeah I agree. In its outlook. Um, and there have been two questions which deal with um, COVID-19 and how what the impact has been, uh, both in Taiwan generally, but particularly at the NTT. What has that had any kind of um, impact um, we do have the big impact we just um cancel some a lot of uh, performances uh, local performances especially international as well you can you can you know then we just uh, cancel um, the performance until like july and part of the performance already shift and postponed to next year but um since the COVID-19 uh, are stable um, in July, so we just open to the public quite uh, just back to the normal. So theater is quite, quite, quite open, quite, 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 quite nice right now. But, but, but right now it's getting like seriously, so we, we don't know how, what will be. But for the arts programs, we are have like uh, uh, we also provide some uh, e-learnings on our websites as well. So we will, uh, in the one hand, then we still do the live performance. Um, on the other hand, then we we still try another ways. Yes. Good. Thank you for all all that. Um, now, uh, Hui Mei, I see there is a mystery man sitting beside yes. you. Yes. Uh, Shi Jie, he's from Jiayi Performing Arts Center. So, and, let's uh, welcome. Pardon me. Let's welcome mm -hmm. him to join us right now. Hello. Oh. So, uh, <coughs> you um you have been um involved with uh Chai Performing Arts Center, am I right? Since two thousand five. Yes. That was even before it opened. You were there as part of the the creation process. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, for, forgive me for not knowing this. When did when did the center actually open? What was the um, official? It's 
2005. Okay. So um, you are interested, I know, in um, national cooperation <clears throat> between other districts and cities in Taiwan and building local artists and audiences. And I imagine that's some of what we will be hearing now from you. Yes. 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 <laughs> okay, let's welcome <laughs> The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Shi Jie from Jai Performing Arts Center. Uh, I would delight to be here to introduce our education in Jai Performing Arts Center. Uh, okay, next. Next. Jai Performing Arts Center. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, <coughs> Jai Performing Arts Center opened in 2005, covering an area of 16 uh, six hectares. It includes a proscenium stage theater with orchestra pit, a black box studio, three rehearsal rooms, three outdoor stage, and a resistance space. Next. The, cap the capacity of the theater is 972 seats, while the Black Box Studio has flexible seating for 200 to 500 persons. Uh, next. Uh, there are also a gallery, an uh, audio visual room, three rehearsal room at the center. Uh, CPAC offers space to performing group applying for resistance. The duration of every resistance is two years. This program help group in resistance grow in size and quality and provide opportunity to communicate and cooperate with each other. Next. The overall operating strategy of the center is include audience, artist, and the theater as one cycle. To build system a matic view of sympathetic uh, symbi development and not to only operate as theater, but to force a market. As for the resource of our education, with the funds of Ministry of Culture, the center is skilled dance education program of art routine project, and the Yun Jia Jia Ying, uh, and the youth theater educational drama of Yun Jia Jia Ying Theater Link, which built a connection of regional theater nearby, with the local project. Uh, with the local budget, we hold educational repertoire, workshop festival, and the resistance campaign on campus project. We also cooperate with other institutions such as Foundation for Culture and the Education and the Community University. Next. Uh, the main skin of MOC art routine project in Jai is dance education. And the CPAC become the only regional art center in Taiwan focusing on dancing community engagement. That is, uh, with folks not only on school, but also on the public. To start a project, we cooperate with school. Now we have already cooperated with 20 schools, ranging from elementary to high school, and including, uh, in, including three formal dance classes for talented students and 17 school-based dance clubs to reach more education dimension. We are about to hold three dance competition for high school and college students. As for community engagement, we hold summer dance camp and the dancing day event. Next. Summer dance camp is held at Temple Square, where traditional art activity usually took place. Participants are of all age, from kids, adult, to the elderly. The dancing activity start in 2018, and there are three temples engaged this year. 
Kuambo Dance Theater, a local dance performing group, is in charge of playing and executing the event. Uh, we got that uh, video about a summer dance dance. Kiss song in Taiwan. Uh, everyone learned to sing it uh, in elementary school. The most interesting part of this plan uh, is to involve modern dance in a place mainly for traditional art. Uh, the dancing day is held at an uh, outdoor stage of CPAC. Community dancing group and the school students are invited to perform dance shows. Moreover, we host street dance competition uh, with this event. Students and people from all age can participate in dance, dance activity. Next. Uh, Yun Jia Jia Yin's, uh, Theater Link is a regional link supported by MOC. It built a connection of four regional art centers in middle south of Taiwan. CPAC is in charge of youth theater program. It includes class teaching, campus drama tour, and the youth drama contest. High risk students also involved in this program. Next. Uh, educational job patrol is held every year to offer the first experience of theater for students in Jai County. For elementary students, we introduce environment theater plan. The show is present is present in a way of a theater guide tour. There are eight shows per year for 80 participants per show. For junior and high school students, we chose proper topic and shows and introduce a literature theater plan. Students are invited into the theater to watch a drama and give feedbacks. There are four shows per year for 200 participants per show. Yes. Uh, every summer, CPAC hold workshop festival, which is open to both uh, professional and uh, the public. This year, half of the workshop was related to dance routine project. Next. Since CPAC has the unique resistance team uh, program, we connect the team with art education. There are seven resistance uh, program group include intense drama, Chinese music, and the tradition puppet. Everything will hold three on campus art activity every year. Uh, to sum up, to maximize the utility function, art education of CPAC consists consist of three different hierarchies, which are MOC, CPAC, and the local art group. Uh, thank you for your listening. Thank you. Um, I will kick off um, with a question about traditional arts and contemporary. Uh, given the, the, the history of traditional arts in Taiwan, I'm interested to know how integrated 
traditional art forms are with contemporary art forms. In terms of performance or education. Okay. And that, that question could be answered by anyone, I think. <laughs> Not only for Shi Jie, right? Yeah,那么在艺术教育上面，那个尤其其实刚才有提到，有人在问，就是你high-risk的学生是学生吗？哦，呃，指的是所谓的边缘性的学生，就是他辍学的，对，辍学中辍的这些。Okay, maybe I can help him in translation a little bit. Uh, he just she just mentioned because um in Jai. Actually, it's not a metropolitan city in Taiwan, so they need different techniques to help those students, especially. So uh, they will have some special project for the students. They are kicked out from school, quitted from school. And I think that's the only project in Taiwan to help these kind of students. And besides that, uh, they they choose dance as their future on um, education is very unusual because it's very different and difficult for the public to get more understanding on dance. So I, I'll just try to just make a supplement for him. Okay. Um because that was a question that came from the audience about high-risk students identifying mm -hmm. who they are and what they do. Um, but what, what about the um, traditional arts and um, contemporary arts? How much study or practice or participation is there in traditional art forms compared to more okay. contemporary? 在现代艺术跟传统艺术上，你比较，你有没有什么比例？还有什么想法？嗯，基本上我们还是比较偏重所谓的现代艺术。那因为它比较能够期待一些观念的东西。那传统艺术比较重视在记忆的传承。Okay
高风险学生，然后他们透过戏剧，然后能够站到台上，变得比较有自信，然后比较比较愿意跟别人接触。You just mentioned about the high-risk students. They train a lot of projects for the student to practice and to perform on the stage. That part is very special for him, and he is personally impressed by the students. Thank you. Now, um, let me just check if we have any comments from our audience. Um, ah, okay. So. We've got one question. Just to one last question: Do you feel the younger generation shows different levels of interest towards traditional and contemporary arts? Younger generation, what is more easy to accept? Um, younger generation, 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 younger 现代艺术反而呃需要我们去的讲解，然后对，反而是比较不容易接触到的。I think he 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 mentioned it's difficult for uh to educate the young people to know more about contemporary arts because a student at school they have a more con uh more training on and knowledge learning from the school on traditional arts. So it's a very good start for the theater to help the people to know more about the contemporary arts. Okay, thank you for clarifying that point. Okay. Now I think、uh, we can probably bring in our third and final guest. Yes, Morag.、Uh, so Morag Days has been the artistic director of Dance Space. Since 1994, she's also a, been a dancer, a teacher, a choreographer, and、uh, for me, because、uh, I've been going to the Fringe for at least 20, 25 years,、uh, I love Dance Space. It's a venue in Edinburgh dedicated to dance, and I kind of think of Morag as the queen of Dance Space. So perhaps on that note, we could let the queen of Dance Space enter. The stage, please. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. In all your royal splendor. <laughs> oh, hello, hello, hello! Good afternoon, good evening, good everything. Thank you, Donald. <laughs> It's always a pleasure to welcome you to the castle. Um. Okay, so. <laughs> Thank you so much to Taiwan Season for inviting me to speak at this seminar, this webinar. I would like to、um, say welcome to Edinburgh, but of course I can't. But I can say hello from everyone at Dance Space. We very much、um, we miss you all coming to Edinburgh, and we love to remember the fantastic success of Taiwan Season in the past. So I'm really, really happy to be engaged with you in some way. In this way, so thank Morag, you so much, Morag. To sing your praises, you have been a consistent supporter and collaborator with Taiwan Season since the beginning. Yes. So yes, I could、that. talk for. Oh, you're so welcome. I could talk for a long time about how respectful I am towards the Taiwanese dance professional dance community and how brave they are. How courageous! How they take many risks, and how they manage to hold on to a fantastic technique and discipline at the same time. It's just amazing how the work has grown so quickly over what is a relatively short amount of time. So, my I have a great deal of respect for Taiwan culture, actually.、Um, but I've been invited, I understand, to talk about education and at Dance Space. Outside of the wonderful festival that we have, we are a dance house, and that means we are also a home. And we have four studios, and we house many, many, many different kinds of classes. So, of course, I can't talk about them all. Although, actually, I can talk about them all, but I don't have time to talk about them all. So, I, I decided, with respect to the understanding what Kwe Mei and Penting are working on, also. That I would choose a part of our education outreach 
work that might apply best to the situation in Taiwan, and that is work with elders. So I'm going to begin by responding to what we what is happening right now and all over the planet, and that is of course COVID-19. So we didn't want people to stop dancing because they couldn't leave their homes. Thinking about the elder community, especially who were also shielded and were not and were in complete social isolation, unable to leave their homes, we decided to apply for some money from our government and to put a series of small uh, dance classes together that people could do in their homes to well, outside of COVID as well, actually, but especially in response to COVID. So I hope that we can play a little section. Um, I don't have the technology, but something might come up right now. I hope so. Here we go. Very old, <laughs> uh, a very old that piece of uh, oh, Scottish traditional music uh, for a very, uh, very lovely little sequence, which shows that even if you cannot leave your chair, you can still dance. And that was the important thing: is that we wanted to make sure that people who maybe had a, a disability or have some sort of injury that they can still move and they can still join in, and um, it, it's worked very well. And in that series called Feel Like Dancing, we also included work for people with young families who were also locked in and for everyone, in fact, all different age groups. But for this uh, webinar, I'm going to talk about elders. Now, usually it's elders who get this terrible disease of Parkinson's. And uh, back in 2001, our patron, in New York, his name is Mark Morris, was approached by someone at his center in Brooklyn and asked if they could do some research into dance and how it might help people with Parkinson's disease. And he said, yes, they came into the studio and they started to make research. Now it has become a global phenomenon. It's completely wonderful. Um, there are 4,000 participants now in Scotland in the national um, work that we do for dance and Parkinson's with our partners also Scottish Ballet are involved as well. Uh, one in every 375 people in Scotland has Parkinson's disease and this could be the case across Europe. I don't know about the situation in Taiwan but it was discovered where the scientists met the artists and they realized that the artists had a way of cutting into a particular kind of neural pathway which is underused in if you have a uh, Parkinson's disease and so doing the movements lit up some 
something inside people and reprogram some of the neural pathways. It's like some kind of miracle. So art meets science and science met art and wonderful things came as a result of that for people who have Parkinson's and of course for their partners and families. So I have a little bit of film that I'd like to show. I hope it's ready. Thank you. Well, I was diagnosed eight years ago with Parkinson's and uh, it's been downhill ever since. Uh, the simple tasks of life come up from become uh, efforts. It's uh, really good now that you can't get appreciated. Well, I was diagnosed just two days before my 50th birthday, so it was a bit of a shock. I couldn't work anymore. I mean, writing is really difficult. My sort of challenges myself is that, you know, I'm not going to be defined by the Parkinson's and so I'm going to keep as fit and as healthy as long as I can. I was very unsteady. I have got better in that respect since coming to the class. It has made me more confident. I come just for the music alone. If there was nothing else, I love the music. The dancing, the music, I feel invigorated, I feel I want to move, I want to dance, I love it. Joyful, related, content, all these, all these emotions, but it lasts for hours. If I speak to the kids or the family, they've come to know that one is a good day for dad. There must be something in it because I just feel so much better. My, my movement and, and freedom in my body is, is much better. It just needs to be funded and research more because there's definitely something about it. It's nice to meet other people with Parkinson's without being sort of maybe a Parkinson's person. We go to talk about Parkinson's, we talk about dance, which is, is really important. You don't feel as though you're doing something clinical. Oh, and it always uh, makes me makes me feel like I want to cry, but not because I'm unhappy, but because I'm happy to see people being free from uh, their restrictions of their lives. And there's something that someone says in that film. She says, um, I didn't feel defined by my disease anymore. And uh, but what she didn't say, but I'm going to say for her and for anyone regardless of their age. You don't need to be defined by your age or your ability or anything else, but you can redefine yourself as a dancer. And it doesn't matter how old you are, and it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in a chair, and it doesn't matter what is happening to your body because of a disease. Of course, it matters, it's important, but you can be freed in so many ways by moving your body. And some people call moving your body dancing. And I'm very, very happy that we share all of that with the people who need it. Now, old age. How old is old age exactly? So if you start at 60 years old and then you can go into old age until you're 95, maybe 100, that's 40 years. That's a long time. And a lot can happen in your body, in your mind and in your life within those years. So we have lots of different ways of looking at age. One is, of course, to do with the diseases that come with it, and it would be stupid and irresponsible if we did not acknowledge those and work with the scientists and the doctors to find ways to help people move through them. And I'm talking about dementia and all sorts of other illnesses that come with age. But then there's the people who don't have those illnesses who still have a burning desire to dance. So several years ago, I created a dance base, a, a company for people who were over 60. It has been a great success. And one of the things I wanted to do especially was to treat this company and the people in it with great respect, but not to treat them like children. And a lot of the time, older people are treated as if they're children. I don't know why. <laughs> I can't imagine. Anyway, so, <laughs> so Prime uh, are a wonderful company. 
And I'm going to, I hope I can talk whilst we are seeing some images of some of the performances that they've done over the years. Um, so there was uh, something to do. There is the Edinburgh Castle, which is really beautiful. This was a mass dance that they did alongside the youth dance company. So people who were young, between 16 and maybe 21, were dancing with people between 60 years old and 85. And uh, it was wonderful. Everyone shared the experience and had a really fantastic time. And we did it all outdoors and we did it during the last Edinburgh Festival. So it was quite shocking for a lot of people to see. The interesting thing about uh, this company, uh, oh, please continue. Thank you. Um, this one was a hip hop dance piece, which was based in a, a, a bingo hall. I don't know if you have bingo in Taiwan, but it's a kind of game, a, a sort of counting game. Uh, which people do, and uh, it was called uh, Old School, which was a play on words. Old School and Old is Cool. So <laughs> we put the two together. And uh, it was very, very funny. Everyone had a great time. But what you'll notice is they're not behaving like children and they're not being given simple choreography. They're, they were doing hip hop to music by Kanye West. They were just having a great time re reviving a new kind of energy in their bodies and their presence of this company is completely great. Can we have the next image, please? Thank you. So, oh my goodness, what's this? <laughs> we were invited to Singapore, to the Silver Arts Festival. Singapore at that time and still I hope now we're very interested in developing work for elders. So the Prime Dance Company uh, came out to Singapore. Uh, we did lots of performances there. And I also did some teaching uh, about, not just about how to teach uh, people who are older, but also teaching a dance class for you regardless of your age. So the class that I taught, there were people who were 22 and also there were people who were 71 and everyone did what they could, and we all had a fantastic time. Um, everyone, as you can see, had a, had a great time, and it was a big adventure. And uh, I can tell you now that the company of Prime are completely without fear and a huge sense of adventure. So the next picture, please. Um, thank you. This piece was done. Uh, it was choreographed by uh, maybe 12 different choreographers made two minute solos for each member of the company. Then we put all of those solos together in one, in one piece to the music of Kate Bush, which is a song called Moving. And we made a piece together for that. Uh, it's an homage to Lindsay Kemp, who was my great teacher. Um, and also, again, it's very much about the presence of people on stage. You don't have to be kicking your leg up around. You can be standing very still. And some of the most powerful moments in some of the work that Prime has done have been when they're just standing and just looking at you. Next uh, image, please. Thank you. So this one was called Tarn. This is a wonderful picture from just a rehearsal. As you can see, there is so much energy in this picture. Uh, the women in this in this uh, are ranging from the age of 66 to about 73. Um, in fact, the lady who's jumping in the background at the time, uh, her age was 76. Uh, and just extraordinary the amount um, the amount of enthusiasm. I think this might be one of the last pictures. If I could see if there's another one. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and then uh, this one was done to the songs of Marlena Dietrich. Uh, they were all dressed in ball gowns and it was very sexy. Uh, and yes, that's right. It was sexy. Older people can be sexy too. So it was also extremely funny. So you see, we wanted to break the rules a lot. Um, I could talk about Prime, as you can probably guess, for quite a long time. Uh, but what I wanted to say was a few things. First of all, 
the, the sharing of skills um, that uh, Kwe May was talking about uh, is absolutely possible. And I would love to work with Taiwan and also to give maybe some ideas about where to go to find out about how to open the door to elders to come in. One of the other benefits that I wanted to mention uh, of having this amazing company and also having a lot of other classes at Dance Space for Elders, regardless of whether they're seated or whether they're jumping, is that it's grown our audience so much because, of course, these people have families, they have grandchildren, they have daughters, they have sons, they have partners, huge extended families who come to see them perform. But then once they have seen them perform, they also start coming to see other things that we do at Dance Space, and which is completely wonderful. So it's a, a real benefit and a, an unexpected benefit that came from it. Our motivation, and this might be useful to think about actually, our motivation was never to grow an audience. Our motivation was to open the door of opportunity to people and give them the chance to find out that dance is something which will make them better, happier, healthier, more open-minded, and glamorous. And uh, also, I was interested that, can I just say that Penting was talking about the growing of audiences, and particularly about young audiences. Um, I would like to suggest that there is, a, and I know this happens at some other venues, that there is a, a panel of people who come and sit around the table and discuss, and that that panel is of all ages, and uh, to know what young people need right now, you need to be talking to young people and because it changes so quickly. Uh, one day it's one thing and two weeks later it's picked up and then three weeks later it's something else. So it's very important to keep on top of things, I think, by having a, a, a juvenile or a young group of people around. I, I think that's really super important. And another thing I find is important in talking about bringing people into the building is that we are all sitting around talking about our audience. We are the audience also. We are the people who go to these performances. We are the people who want know what we want to see as well. So don't, don't uh, separate yourself from these lovely people who are going to keep things going. I was really super inspired, can I just say, and I know I may be going over time, that's very normal for me, I'm sorry. Um, the sharing, uh, the, the penting and Huey Mei, and the things that you were saying, um, uh, and Shi Xing as well, the things that you were saying about your centers, so exciting for me to hear. Such beautiful spaces that you have available, and so many opportunities for so many people. Um, I really wish you a, a great deal of luck and, and goodwill for it. I hope that you fill them with happy people. But I think that for me at Dance Space, the lesson that I have learned over the years and continue to learn, because we're all learning all the time, is that my, if my motivation is right, then uh, the outcome will be right. And for the motivation at Dance Space, our, our, our main motivation, our mission statement, is that dance should be available for everyone. And it's the dance that's available, not the tickets, not the seats, not the doors are open wide so that we can get lots of people. The doors are open wide because we want to be welcoming. And so I think that that's a really nice to come from that place, uh, not shying away from the fact that you have to sell tickets. But um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I've, I've, gone, I've gone rather off market as usual. Um, I'll do a little swish like this and that means I'm finished. <laughs> Morag, I think going off book, off market is very valuable and inspiring. I, I like that as well. And just in honor of you, I just want to say a little bit of Marlena Dietrich. Go we'll see <laughs> what the boys in the back room will have. That's the reason I'm doing that, not, it's oh. not just a random song. I was thinking about Prime. Am I right that all the members no, of Prime No, we are have female? two men now. Yes, indeed. And not only do we have two men, but one of them is a priest. <laughs> and, another, and another one is a psychotherapist. So 
Oh, we, we, we just got the complete package now. <laughs> are, are they recently joined Prime, I take it, yes, or within the last? Yes, um, since you last saw Prime, yes, that's right. Um, how many members of Prime are there? Um, right now, I think there's about 12 and plus the two guys, yeah, there's about 14 altogether. And right now we're working with a, a, a company that you probably have heard of called Curious Seed, uh, which is headed up by Christine Devani. And I invited Christine Devani to come and do some work with Prime over the autumn, uh, probably digitally. So not only is it going to be digital and on film, but it's also going to be in a field because uh, we can't get together in a studio because of restrictions. So we're going to do it all al fresco. Oh, good. So um, uh, I'm, um, I am, oh, go ahead, Hui Mei, go ahead. Can I have a question for Mora? Uh, I appreciate you sharing with us about Prime. It's quite impressive. I have the question is, um, is you need the choreography, to work with the physicians before you start the classes? Do you need a specialist to help you to, to work on that? Because I don't think we, the dancers, they have the technique to work with the Parkinson's people or the elders. So what's your point of view? Um, I hope I understand your question, Huimei. You're asking me about uh, learning to work with people with different kinds of situations because yeah. of aging. Yeah. So certainly the Parkinson's is absolutely um, a syllabus which you learn, which is formally taught and follows a certain pathway. So for sure you can go somewhere and you can learn, if you need to have a dance background, but you can learn how to teach people with Parkinson's. Um, but what you can't learn, I, well, maybe you can, I don't think so. Um, what you, you can learn the technique of what's required because the scientists have said this will work best. But what you can't learn is how to be warm hearted and compassionate. So that has to go as part and parcel. So here we have the technique and here we have the, the open uh, hearted situation. The two have to come together. And so it needs to be a very particular kind of patience, person with patience and understanding who is going to be teaching that. And so um, the training that you can do for that comes in different ways. Um, in the UK, uh, I believe someone at the English National Ballet was doing it for a while, uh, Fergus Early. Donald, I don't know if you know any more about that. Certainly um, in America, if you wanted to go there, then your teachers would go to Brooklyn to the Mark Morris uh, Center, um, lots of different places. And I can certainly give you all the contacts that you need to find out how to work with people with Parkinson's. Also, it's really good for musicians to be part of that because live music is very important to those classes. In terms of working with Prime, with a, a dance company who are over 60, then you just go in and you ask the obvious question. Does everyone still have their hips? Does everyone still have their knees? <laughs> Quite a lot of people don't. <laughs> so then you start to get the idea, okay, we won't do too much uh, rolling around on the floor for this, or we won't do too much jumping at that part or so on. So you uh, amend the choreography. And then for the seated classes, then that's a whole other situation because for the seated classes, you need to be thinking about how people are bending from their waist, from their hips. They don't have Parkinson's probably. So there's a lot more mobility that's possible and they can have more fun with it. And it's very important that the seated classes are very jolly and very uplifting. So um, there's different kinds of training for different kinds of groups. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, thank you. I, I think you answered some questions, and again, you went to, off into other areas that were really useful <laughs> here. And to to audience, I just want to say you are invited to join us in 
the StreamYard room, if you like. Um, you know, in, in just a moment, I'll open that invitation to anybody who might want to engage with us a bit more directly. Morag, I don't know if I've told you about, um, uh, as somebody who's 63, I'm involved in a, I guess, a community dance group, and I am the token male in that dance group. It's called Posh Club Dance Club. And uh, I don't mind being considered one of the ladies, you know, because sometimes it's like ladies, you know, they don't bother saying, and gentlemen, but but uh, to go back to the thing about about men and dance, and I want to bring this out to our Taiwanese colleagues. Um, often it's women who participate in classes and workshops and things, uh, or maybe with street dance, it's more boys. But I wondered about that, you know, to be a bit binary in terms of gender. Um, forgive me for that. Uh, are there um, issues about attracting to any programs you might be doing, men or boys, uh, for anybody on the panel. Maybe I can share my experience in the National Theatre and Concert Hall. Over 70% audience are female. So that's why we have to focus on the the gender. We want to invite more males to participate for the cultural events or activities, but somehow it doesn't work because I think they are busy with their business or, or something else. And for the young, the youth, I think the part is also very difficult because we are not only challenged by all com competition with other theaters, we also have to be challenged by the a video game or the a lot of uh, uh, 3D or films or, or a lot of uh, sports. So I think maybe for the question for our colleagues in Taiwan, how we have to face the competition is... is <laughs> I have a question. Okay, so let's... Um, I'm curious about that because now I don't have my own theater, but I still looking for my colleagues. They can take care of this kind of a problem. Morag, you were going to yes, say- Yes, some, someone's asked me to lower uh, the volume on my computer. So I've done that. Is that okay? Is that better? Probably. Do you know that you Emil hear? Zola, uh, Morag, Emil Zola said, I came to live out loud. Perhaps that is something you did as well. I'm sorry if it sounded like I was shouting at everyone. What I was, what I was just about to say during uh, Kwe Mei, when Kwame was talking, I realized that she's sitting next to Shi Che, who is also a Taiwanese man. So yes. maybe he could tell us. Maybe he could tell us what would get him into a theater or into a dance studio. Or if not himself, then some of his uh, gentlemen friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Because 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 I Because I the situation is happened in Jai, just like uh, in Taipei, so he doesn't have the answer. How about Benji? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, but, but, but he personally knows what he feels and what he thinks. So okay. I'm just wondering what he would like, what, what would be the thing that would bring him into the dance studio and get him dancing? You say men just uh, interest in sports more than in dance. Yeah, what a shame. So, <laughs> you, but you can um, you can combine sport and dance and sports, right? <laughs> yeah, martial arts uh, is a, the perfect example, of course, of uh, combining. And you'd be very hard, very hard for you to find any female uh, dancers in street dance. So there is a certain kind of male 
dance thing which is acceptable uh, anyway it's a long conversation and it's, well, I'm, I'm, thinking about, it. I'm thinking about games and the supposed competitive nature of masculinity perhaps there are ways of, of uh, implementing games playing and competition in a healthy uh, natural more natural kind of way in the arts could, could I also say as a, a, a male identified human being in touch with his feminine side, I, I'm very, I'm personally very interested in multidisciplinary creative activity. And I don't, I just offer that to anybody, not to say anything about it, but I, I want to, I'm hungry to learn about dance and music and, and visual arts and being engaged in that. So uh, perhaps there's that kind of thing. Also, I wanted to ask about intergenerational activity in Scotland and in Taiwan. Could anybody speak about uh, how much intergenerational interaction there is? Well, we've done a lot at Dance Space. Uh, and I remember there was once there was a documentary being made about different pockets of dance around Scotland. And there was a, a very, very naughty bunch of boys from a town in between Edinburgh and Glasgow who were, of course, break dancers. And there was also our elders. And there were other groups around. But I remember when we came together for the finale, um, we all went on different buses from around the country to film the finale in Glasgow for this TV show. And um, I remember that the... Uh, the very youngest group of boys and the elder group from Edinburgh were on the same bus and the boys behaved so well and they were very very respectful of their elders and so there was really it was a really interesting dynamic where the uh, the elders were in, not in charge exactly but that they the elders sort of calmed down the this young group of boys who were usually so boisterous and kind of a bit aggressive. Um, it was wonderful to see them work together. And a lot of stories get told, I think, in intergenerational work, especially between young and old. Uh, it's really beautiful, actually. Um, as long as people don't get caught up in their stereotypes. And what about in Taiwan, um, intergenerational interaction in the arts? Maybe Vinci, you say something? I think we haven't gone like further to do the interaction, intergenerations to inter interactions. I'm not quite sure how about Hui I think about... it's possible because you cannot shut down the doors and no touch with others, especially with uh, such as uh, like Morak, if I know you um, earlier, I will invite you to give a lot, a lot of workshop in Taipei and to share how to work with the others. And especially crime is very, very touching to inspire our other people because we have a, a, a small group and we try to cultivate them to make their own choreography. Mm. And it's just a beginning. So I think that's, that's it needs more interaction afterwards. So, so here we've identified a strand of, of um, potential for mm. Taiwan, which I think is very encouraging. Um, yeah. I would also now like to encourage if there's anybody who has either a question uh, that they want to write in or would like to join us. Um, I know if I, may, if I may identify you, Gary, you mentioned Gary Platt, uh, who was, has been present in the previous sessions. You mentioned an article by the, um, the uh, terrific uh, arts uh, journalist, Lynn Gardner in the UK, that I think you said was in the stage. Um, but I forgot, I forgot now what that article was about. It was an issue we were addressing earlier. Gary, would you have any uh, um, 
qualms about appearing with us uh, if you're still there. Um, I also noticed Frida or Ryan um, had some questions and comments earlier. So anybody feeling up to that? It's okay if not, but I thought I would roll out the red carpet to invite you to join us. Oh. We'll wait about 30 seconds, 20 seconds. Uh, see if anybody takes up my offer. Maybe I wasn't seductive enough. I don't oh, know. You're more than seductive. Thank you. Thank you, Morag. Um, all right, moving along. Um, do any of you, are, are there, is there anything that you have a, a burning desire to bring up? Uh, because we're, we're reaching towards the end of our time together. And what what else would you like to address or tease out in conversation together? Anybody? I would really like to say something about control. Um, uh, that something uh, uh, between uh, chaos and order. So when you get a bunch of people in the studio together, let's say you've got a choreographer and some teenagers and some over 60s, then leave them to it. That, that, that somehow there will be a mess, a soup, a strange chaos will happen. And then slowly out of that will come some kind of new reason for that group to exist. And so uh, this is, I've noticed over the years, I didn't invent this idea. I've just noticed that this is what happens in the good situation in the studio with those groups is that we have to somehow uh, not allow because that is also about control but we have to be patient and step back and give artists and the people they're working with the space to find the idea that having the idea doesn't need to necessarily be there but, uh, it's like a laboratory i suppose to experiment mm -hmm. thank you you know i i'm thinking more based on what you said uh, about my own interest in clarity and order and at the other end of a spectrum chaos and messiness and how i find both extremes uh attractive and in the kind of uh, work that i might do creatively or as a journalist or even as a creative human being and living i i want i want to embrace both of those um qualities and so to hear how that can be acknowledged in arts education perhaps it comes out of allowing a space for people to be at their most authentic whether it is quite ordered or, or clarified or messy and chaotic um i don't know uh, any thoughts about that it needs patience and patience is the opposite of aggression. So if you if you give if you're patient, then you're being kind. Also, I think it is very precious time for us to cool down and to take a uh, slow down a little bit to think more and be patient to wait the brightness. And I, I see we've had a comment from um, Pell Ensemble about allowing the audience and the community to be a part of the making process in all steps so that it's not just led by the artists or the administrators, it's led by the people who are involved themselves, who are also regarded and treated as artists. And from um, Pell of Gary, Right. Seeing as I'm in the presence of royalty, I've, I've just got one. Queen and Queen. Okay. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Gary, you're, you're uh, an arts writer, is that right? A, a, a photographer, Ben, primarily, of dance. And uh, thank you for being here and for joining us. Um, you have um, earlier, you mentioned uh, in, in the comments about an article that Lynn uh, wrote, but you have to forgive me, I've forgotten what that was about. And I wonder if you could encapsulate 
that and use it as a trigger point to round up today's session. Well, this, this article is quite chilling, actually, because she talks about what the impact is likely to be of COVID with the fringe. And the issue that it's raised that was most alarming. Um, Gary, could, could you um, uh, mute your YouTube? Okay. Because he talks about what? How's that? Yeah, he's better. Thank you. Not better. Sorry. So, um, basically, the, the, the fringe office is working on a projection of a reduction of participants in the order of 60% the next year. That is a huge number. Now, bear in mind, uh, the population of those performers is a huge number that are not connected with dance. But I suspect in terms of, uh, you know, integration of society, integration of dance and, you know, the arts into society, the way we're talking about it, I think COVID is going to have a much bigger and longer term impact than we currently think or consider. So thoughts from the panelists about to return to that theme, which is urgent and present and not going away, impact of COVID, how to deal with it, uh, how to survive and thrive despite these new challenges. Uh, okay. I think for uh, the National Taichung Theatre, who are already um, for the arts education programs, we already um, contact for because we have some international courses, so we are planning to do the online courses. So definitely, we have to do for the next step. Also, we do some online uh, learning like e stage. So we uh, we are planning to do the, some master classes for the professional. Uh, that, that what we will see uh, is is it going to work or not? So we just try to um, create more opportunities to people who still wants to um, participate uh, the performing arts that we create our channels for them to to join. But on the way, of, of course, that uh, um, luckily that we still are going for the live performances. So we will do uh, parallels, two ways together. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts about how to deal with the challenge? I, I know, Morag, you've mentioned uh, work with Prime set in a field. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other things that you are doing at Dance Space to address this, you know, loss of income, loss of audience, loss of of the flesh, the flesh presence, perhaps? Yes, yes, and yes. And hello, Gary, who is normally sitting on the couch uh, as I walk into Dance Space during the festival. So it's lovely to see you, Gary. Um, and you. Uh, yeah, uh, we are. Um, we miss you. Um, okay, so yes, there's the field. Um, there's also, uh, there's a, for example, this is just an example. There's a, a duet called Buff and Sheen. And Buff and Sheen are pretend uh, window cleaners and they come to your house and they clean your window, but they also make a dance and get people on the other side of the window to respond. So in some ways, I, I've noticed a lot of visual artists, for example, are finding that the sudden silence and the sudden lockdown is incredibly powerful and good for them. But for dance, of course, it's very different and very upsetting and very sad. But it is drawing people into the environment. And not only from a point of view of hearing birdsong more or just being aware of the silence more, um, it's actually drawing dance artists out into ecology and into the field and into the forest and into the mountain. In fact, there was quite recently a, a work called Into the Mountain by a dancer called Simone Kenyon. So there's a lot of work that's being done. And I think 
It was interesting what you said there, Donald, uh, something about how are we going to survive and thrive, I think was what you said. And actually, what's the opposite? We're not going to stop surviving and we're not going to not thrive. It's just how we do that. How are we going to approach it? Are we going to approach COVID and all the restrictions as some kind of a terrible thumb from God coming down upon us? Or are we going to see it as a new set of opportunities which changes every day? It could be that it brings out creativity in so many people. In terms of the building, sternum to sternum, we are allowed two meters only between dancers. We have to allow people into the building one way and have them leave the building the other way. They cannot use the changing rooms. Uh, it's horrible, but it's not impossible. And maybe after all these months of not being able to dance in a room together, suddenly the magic of dancing in a room together will be even more heightened when we can. So let's, I hope we can find some kind of way to re-engage and refresh our enthusiasm for dancing together in a room. But yes, it will take a long time. And Gary is quite right to be the, the, the angel of doom. But also, um, I think that there's some positive sides that we maybe were getting a little bit too uh, full of ourselves and that now we are being, um, we are being brought to think about really what we, what we love. Someone, one of my neighbors uh, made a card. It, called, it said, Mother Nature has had enough and has sent us all to our rooms. So maybe it's a nice time to uh, re-engage in a different way. And I, I'd like to um, address this question to um, Che Che because uh, at Chai Art Center, you have a lot of space um, and I wonder how that space can be used at this time most productively. Actually, there are seven residence companies stay in his studios so there's no more space for to 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 use actually so is that I your, like to, yeah. answer your questions so cannot be yeah. more pro productive no space at all <laughs> so then perhaps the, the the real question is what is taiwan uh society doing right or or well that allows uh, much less restrictions than other countries. That that's probably a bigger question than we want to deal with now. But I I'm very I'm I admire that this is happening in Taiwan and that there are places where the limitations are are not as necessary to be dealt with. That's right. That's why I agree with you. <laughs> I think, it, it, in my opinion, maybe it's good timing for for Taiwanese artists to have more time to think about it, their work, because normally they are quite busy to produce. They are very productive, but maybe so what we are thinking that when we program the activities, we think that might be a a good time for I, I'm not sure it's right or wrong, but I think maybe it's a good time for them to 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 come down to have a re more rest to have time to research so uh, to do to do the next to to ready for the next step. So this is what we are thinking that we give more uh, opportunities to um, if the budget put down the budgets on the new artists as well to give them. Uh, chance to to work with the, the, the artists then they when they get ready they, they can just have their own um, own show or performance in the near future well it's it's um uh here's a song i'm so glad we've had this time together <laughs> just to have a laugh and sing a song and we just get started and before you know it 
It's the time we have to say so long. So we're going to, thanks for indulging me. Uh, we're going to end this session now. Um, thank you so much, Penting, Shiche, uh, Gary, as our guest, Morag, and Kwe keynote speaker. Thank you for being here. Uh, Taiwan Season Online Symposium 2020, Connecting with Taiwan, will be back in full flow next week. Uh, Monday, August 10th, showcase and pitch through the fringe. If you're an art industry member or just a pushy person, go there and get accreditation and come and learn about the Taiwanese choreographers and work. And then there's an informal conversation on Tuesday with um, Hong Dance, uh, between Hong Dance and me about the work Boundless, uh, which will be repeated on Thursday. And then next week, turning to my notes, we are looking at disability arts uh, on the 12th and 14th, Wednesday and Friday. Uh, so we have uh, quite a busy schedule. Thank you once again for being here. Be safe, be creative, enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.